part of a delegation from Vineyard and Cape Cod uh, looking at uh, different wind turbines on Cape Cod, uh, the larger ones, uh, trying to get a feel for the permitting process that the owners of the turbines have had to go through, uh, uh, some of the economics of the facilities, the amount of energy they're generating, uh, specifications of the the uh, turbines, the height, the rotor diameter, the power, uh, and also to kind of uh, hear what the, the reaction by the community has been to. Has there been any problems with the noise, uh, shadow flicker, uh, and we're, we're hearing some things. Uh, we're going to look at the, the facility at Woods Hole Research Center, uh, which is a 100 kilowatt machines. It's the smallest of the ones we're going to see. That's my car idea. Um, you can see over there on the porch roof there, on the flat, we got some, uh, oh, uh, probably eight kilowatts of PV power, and the whole roof of the addition, that's the back that you don't see from the road really, is covered with so photovoltaic panels as well. So it's the total system size, about 26 kilowatts of PV which used to be a pretty big number, but it's getting smaller as people get bigger and bigger systems out there. And that, when we opened the building, that TV system provided about a third of the total power of the building, which is a pretty sizable fraction relative to a 20,000 square foot building, because we were able to manage to get our electrical loads really quite down far, with decent envelope, decent doors and windows, and a decent amount of attention to the mechanical systems that were designed and employed. Um, it's got a ground source heating and cooling system. And um, that is that geothermal? Yeah, geothermal. And it works well, and it's not without maintenance. And the design could be better, I think. Um, it's got a steel <coughs> column well. So while we're pleased with performance, we're not thrilled with performance. And we've actually just purchased that house next door. I can't see behind the tent, but it's, it's the old carriage house to that building right over there, one of the three old Victorian mansions on the hill. And we just about finished retrofitting that, what they call a deep energy retrofit, which is essentially what this was before deep energy retrofit became this new word. But it's just, you know, if people are actually doing deep energy retrofits, that's an awesome thing, because that means you're actually moving in the direction of driving down your loads, your electrical loads, so that on-site renewables becomes really practical, I think. Um, and from experience, we've seen that. Um, so the other two-thirds of the power, we're hoping to have a, a carbon-neutral facility here. Um, and the other two-thirds of the power is still coming from the grid. Um, and so we had our sight, our eyes on always installing the wind turbines here. And it took us a while to figure out how much wind there was and to figure out what machine we wanted and how we were going to get it permitted and accepted by the local community. And um, so we finally got it installed. You know, the rotor went up in August. The power finally went on for real in November. And um, it's been cranking away. This is an amazing morning. I came in, I think, oh, it's broken. What happened? <laughs> Then is there's no wind. And when I say there's no wind, then I go and look in the trees. Is there really no wind? And there's not much wind, and those flags are barely doing anything. So I went downstairs, and now there's like standby waiting for wind. Um, what uh, wind speed do, um, does it have to achieve in order for that to start moving? I know you know, saying. what happens is it spools up at, depending on how gusty the wind really uh -huh. is, you know, 10, 11 miles an hour, it'll start up. Uh -huh. But it'll continue running if it goes back to eight, seven miles an hour and then picks off if it's gusty, but it, you know, to get it to that initial, get the inertia going, then you need a couple gusts at 11 miles an hour. Okay. So um, what are you doing with no electricity right now? Well, it's, well it's whatever's Test falling on the PV system and going to the panels, going to the building, and the remaining is coming from the grid. And like any grid tie system, both these systems don't operate without the grid. And the grid, you know, that meter that NSTAR provides you is the battery terminal, you know, and that's that's your 100% efficient battery. So it's a it's a good it's a good deal. And we couldn't put up a wind machine like this if we were not grid connected, just because they there has to be some place for all that power to go all the time. Does it start on its own, or does it need a little? 
No, it starts on its own. And if it, if like if it was ro going along, rolling around at seven miles an hour, it's not doing anything other than freewheeling. It's just like a bicycle wheel. Just freewheels along, just enough. Oh, when do you have to shut it down for when it have high winds? Or it, you? it pays attention to itself. It does not need human intervention to uh, stop itself, to protect itself. And there are two or three or four ways that that self-protection happens because the last thing you want in a wind machine is to have a runaway condition. And because they're spectacular. Boom. <laughs> but um, so there are two brake systems and it's a what's called a uh, what's it called Megan? The rotors don't turn. Feather? The blades feather. They do not feather. No, they don't. No. So it's a stall regulated yeah, machine. Stall regulated. stall regulated machine. And what a stall regulated machine is is that um, how many sailors do you have here? Okay, the sailors will understand this right away. Um, when you're pinching the nose into the wind, you start to stall the boat. That's what stall regulation is. So as the wind goes faster and faster and faster, the shape of the blade relative to the wind speed becomes suboptimal. You're just pinching it into the wind. And that's how it works. Now, lots of other machines have... Does everybody laid... understand that analogy? Is everybody getting it? No. Okay. If you want to explain yeah. it a little bit. I'll try it one more time, but um, basically, you can't sail into the wind because it's pushing you backwards. And as the shape of the blade, it, as the wind comes at a longer angle to the shape of the blade, then the tri bolt tries to heel over, but you go forward. Like that. But if you start pinching it into the wind, you lose that optimal shape to the blade. And you're not so it getting stalls. Right. You no know, longer get forward thrust because you don't longer have the but, shape of the wing against the wind. But the blades don't. They don't cut. feather. The, the wind, wind is right. the yeah. thing that provides that it's angle. The, but it's the, the yaw wind speed. also, right? Your yaw because this is a yawing machine, so it's kind of turning into it itself, so that it's no longer getting full thrust of the wind. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, this, this, when, when you look at the dials, Megan, when you look at the dials, sorry, the wind is blowing directly into. Uh, that's what it's trying to do. So it's getting full surface area of the blades. But in order to stall out, it wants to change that. The wind is going like this all the time. It's going from here. It's going from there. It's going from here. It's going from there. The wind, the the rotor, the big pinwheel up there, is facing into the wind. And only after a 10 minute change in the average wind speed does it think, oh, maybe we'll go this way. And then it moves that way. <laughs> only every 10 minutes does it even think about moving. So when the wind is going faster and slower and faster and slower, and let's just say it's blowing 25 miles an hour to 35 miles an hour, and it's going to produce, on average, at 25 miles an hour, about 100 kilowatts. It's going to produce its rated power. But when the wind gusts up to 35 miles an hour, it's the fa fact that the wind's going faster across the shape of the blade that makes the energy capture suboptimal. It's not the machine responding to this wildly variable directional change in the wind. I okay, promise. so it's different than the other turbine. Like the V82 feathers and turns out of the wind to protect itself. When, when you get to this situation when the machine is Actually, I don't know how that's. I don't know it's how that's. The big that's one like that. that we're going to go see next. That's right. what it does. Is so it when, feathers? When, when it, okay. And then it turns. Out. To slow down. To slow down. To slow down. So to slow down. It's no to actually, that's, get beat up. that's self protection as opposed to energy reg regulation. So how does this one do? This one just shuts itself down. It says, I, so I'm stopping. 35 miles an hour or 45 miles an hour for 10 minutes or whatever the averaging interval is, they just shut it down. What happens in like a nor'easter if you have. 30 mile an hour winds with 60 mile an hour gusts. It, it just cranks out the power. Wow. It cranks out the power. And what happens is um, the energy power output, with, if you increase the wind speed, the energy power output goes to about 100 kilowatts and then stays there. And then it starts coming down. As the winds get stronger and stronger, you get more and more force in the winds. The machine just like, the, the, the blades become so suboptimal for energy capture. and. The machine says, oh, I'm just going to slow it down and let all that extra, way too much energy buy. So and that's part of the self-protection. That's, because that's the, fact the very that first mode of self-protection. It's like a governor on a gasoline engine. <coughs> it doesn't, it won't over rip. It knows when it to slow down. It backs off. Exactly. Yeah, I, I don't need all that power. So the optimum wind speed is 
25 to 30 Around miles? 25, 28 miles an hour, yeah. And then that, that slowing down is achieved by braking in this mile? No. That slowing down will be, well, electronic braking in terms of adding load to the generator to slow it down. Okay. You know? But the blades, but because the wind's getting faster and faster and faster and gustier and less productive, mm -hmm. um, they're also seeing a less optimal path across the blade. So it, it's dumping power. The sail is dumping okay. power. But is it, at, the, at higher wind speeds, it is still producing 100 kW? The curve goes up to 100 kW and sits there for a while, and up it, to about 30 miles an hour, and then it starts falling off. Absolutely. Yeah, and, be, and the reason it's falling off is because if you think about the, the power inherent in wind, this is the fundamental concept. This is. Nah, very good. <laughs> you need that color to show. She's soft around. Yeah, she's just a piece of. Uh, So this is your graph of power output with increase in wind speed. No, I know I don't. I really this don't. is highly technical. So <laughs> as we go from 10 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour to 30 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour, the actual power available in the wind goes like this. So it's a cubic law. It's a cubic law. So you have obscene amounts of power that would destroy any wind turbine as you get really fast winds. They can't deal with it. So what happens is the power output of the machine goes like this, up with the cubic law to 100 kilowatts, and then as the power goes obscene here, this goes, whoa, thanks, no thanks. <laughs> you know, protecting myself, and it gets to a certain point where it just, it just puts on the brake and shuts itself off. And does, the optimum, 30... does the optimal wind power go up the bigger the blade mm -hmm. or the bigger the unit? That's a good thing. No. Doesn't? I, I, different machines designed for different optimum along here, depending on the wind resource and the length of your blades and whether you've got a low wind side, a medium wind side, or a high wind side. But everybody protects against catastrophe. But that's, that's the, the whole design. Catastrophe occur at a higher level, the potential with a high, bigger no, unit. No, the watts per, the watts per square meter going across the surface area is that. And so different people design different places to protect the machine for, but... So a 3 megawatt and a, and a 600 kilowatt are going to shut off at about the same point. It's 50 depends is how they're engineered. It really depends on how the machine is engineered. Well, yeah, but but, but with, within a certain framework, there's not a lot of leeway. You want, you want both an efficient machine and it has to self-protect, and there's a lot of power. The power goes up as so. How does it shut itself down? <coughs> this shuts itself, this starts slowing itself down by adding more load to the generator, yeah. and then when it's time to shut down, it releases the hydraulics on the brakes, and the brakes go, and it goes, it shuts itself down. All the way down, stops the blade? Within two, ro two uh, revolutions, if not one. Does Maybe it make that noise? Being generated by the no power. <laughs> and so if the grid goes out, the brakes go off, because the local motor that kept the brakes on shuts off, the heat ale's safe. The brake light, automobile brake? Probably more like a truck or a yeah, machine. Kind of a yeah, break. yeah. Mm -hmm. essentially, a couple, a couple. It goes. And what's that wind speed where it shuts down? Well, if the grid flickers off, that's the wind speed. If, if, if you lose the power, it's out of there. No, I mean, what, like 35? Oh, 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 you know, I have never figured out watching when it shuts itself off. Okay. And it, it's probably a certain gust for a certain amount of time after a certain average wind speed, but... It's well, 50, 50 miles an hour. <laughs> this is doing it... This, we've seen gusts of 80. Yeah. With wild machines running. Um, wow! But it didn't, it doesn't respond to a gust. Maybe it responds to what's the last, I don't know what the average period is. I think it's, well, for some of the large utility scale machines, it's 10 minutes, 50 miles an hour, down it goes. It's a little too rough. Because if it's a gust. I mean, and this wouldn't be much different than that, really. This wouldn't be much different than that. Have you had a brake shut down? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They it worked the way it was supposed to. 
<laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't like get to, you have to play unless it shows that. This isn't the oil business. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole test before you can even go online with this machine that the utility makes you run through yeah. that tests all of that to be sure. That Actually, the no utility backfeeding. doesn't care if it shuts down or not. No, no, but they don't want it back feeding. Yeah, just they don't want it saying. starting back up when it's not supposed to. Right. They don't care if you wreck your machine. <laughs> the failures that have happened, is that been a failure in the braking system? Of what machines? The, well, the couple of vocals that have thrown away. Totally different caliber of technology. It's a different scale. I mean, you're talking about a home scale wind machine right. where you have moving parts and essentially no complex electronic regulation system. So it's this more is of a, a owner operated braking system. It really system. is, and they have some of them have more mechanical parts. And the one that failed over at Peck's Boatyard, I love that machine. It's a really cool machine, nice design. Um, but the problem, the thing that really beats up wind machines of any size is turbulence. And so that was a really turbulent night. And you have this um, machine that is, it's, it's a downwind machine, so the wind's coming from my back. And every time it gusts one way or the other way, it puts phenomenal stresses on this gyroscope who want to stay in place. And these blades go like this, you know, in, in situations when you have lots of gusts and big strong winds and lots of RPMs. And so this machine, and all big machines, avoid that completely by saying, oh, I'll look this way for 10 minutes, and if the average changes, I'll go that way. So they don't have any of this, you know, they just, any, any turbulence is just energy that dumped off the machine. And there's a whole testing thing as well that's different between the small wind and the large wind. I mean, this is the machine that's basically at the threshold of large wind. And so this machine has been tested out at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, it, you know, this machine was working in the Arctic for many, 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 many years with a, um, a different setup. And they went, how many years ago, Joe, did they? Yeah, they got into Four the years ago. Redesigned well, it? They've been redesigned for a while and they've gone through a couple of iterations and now the commercial model is three or four years old. But the testing piece is what's really important. Um, and that on the small wind side of things, the testing is just starting to get established. So it's comparing apples and oranges in terms of saying Pex turbine, you know, the, that probe and compare it to this, you can't do it. It's, it's, it's more like fair. comparing bicycles and cars. Yeah. In terms of the technology Simplicity, and the yes, weight absolutely. of the technology and the design of the technology, that's that's a, a more apt comparison. I think, an apt comparison. So, changing the subject slightly, sure. as installed, what's the predicted lifetime of this unit? I ran my spreadsheet for 20 years. Well, well you ran your spreadsheet doesn't mean what the manufacturer's no, guaranteed lifetime long, is. And it's just like a car or a truck. So the it's answer like is you, you don't know. It. So the answer no. is you don't know. Actually, no, I don't know. I do know. Okay. I, what I do know is because, of course, these things haven't been around for that many years, but I do know is that there's a big refurbished market for all the utility scale wind turbines that came off, and you just change the bearings and you change the components and you maintain things like my 47 Farmall Cub tractor, and it'll still run because it's a machine. <laughs> well, if you, you know, good maintenance, if you maintain and it on. and you replace the wearable parts, I'm not sure it, when it, it is too expensive to continue maintaining this piece of crap, you get a new one because it's going to make you more money. Who's so, the manufacturer? This is Northern Power Systems. Out of, out of Vermont. Out of Vermont. Great, great crew. They know their engineering. They've been doing this for a long time. And this, this machine is... It's a really nice piece of machine. Okay. Do you want to talk about the generator? And the, yeah, let me tell you about generators. the next generators versus uh, gearbox machines. And so the design trend has gone away from using transmissions and gearboxes towards direct drives. That just means that the little generator that's up there, the three-phase generator, has a bigger armature, it's a larger piece of machinery, and the wind, it's directly connected to the rotor going around. Or not. And so the other machines have used more typical generators connected to a gearbox so the big rotor can go around and that speed is increased through the transmission to spin the generator faster. We now have a transmission, which is a big failure component, and you have to maintain that and it's heavy and it costs money. And, um, you know, a transmission is a big, you know, you have to place transmission. Uh, 
But in addition to the direct drive component, the other thing that's really important has been the electronic control of these systems. And that's where most of the advances have been made to make machines like this and big megawatt class machines possible is how they're electronically regulating what's going on in, in the generator. How do you get up there and maintain it? In, in the ladder. In the ladder? Yeah. Inside? Do you want to climb up? I see an opening. No. I mean, I've been up and uh, they just got a ladder with safety, safety, you put your safety harness on there and they've got these fall protection systems so if you fall off, have a heart attack or whatever, it'll keep you from dropping all the water. Sorry? Yeah, you can look in there. There's just two different platforms where they go up the two. Climb up the ladder. How tall is that, Joe? I think it's up. Uh, it's a 37-meter tower. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many feet is that? Uh, 125 feet to the, to the rotor. To the, to the, to the, to the hub of the motor. To the hub. Yeah. And it's a 22-meter rotor diameter. What, what's it? What's a, what is that in feet? 21. 21? Yep. This is 80 feet above sea level. 82 or something like that. Okay, so this tower normally would have to be a lot taller. Than These guys make two or three different towers and that's all you get because tower design is inherently fundamental to the operation of the structural system. I've, and I've learned a lot about that because we, for years ago, we wanted a taller tower and it took them years to come up with a taller tower. We didn't buy 25 meter tower because it's not tall enough for around here. Is this their tallest? This is, the, this is their standard offering now, which is their tallest. 37 meter tower. You mentioned testing before, testing on the larger units, less so on the residential units. Yeah. Uh, who does the testing? Well, the different entities do the testing. Um, there's, a, there's a big. Uh, NREL tested this machine, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And they tested some smaller machines, but the, the, some of the Danish certification authorities, the German certification authorities who have done all the testing development sort of stuff like the like the UL sort of stuff over there that the globe relies on for right. our evaluation. Right, in terms of a standard for in electronics and interface yeah, and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. No, no, no. And you wouldn't believe anyone who did it. Right. Um, I'm supposed to talk about noise, shadow flicker. Well, why don't you if you could talk about what the local permitting process was for you to erect the tower. Yep. Um, and then... Oh, this is the one that made a commission. <laughs> yeah. 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 discussion. Um, and then um, how, how it's been received. Yep. Okay. Uh, we're a nonprofit 501c3 educational organization. So we were not technically required to go through the special permit hearing process for the town of Falmouth. Uh, this machine does meet all the requirements of the zoning code, as it's currently written, setback ratios and all that sort of stuff. And so we opted to exercise our rights by state law to not go through a special permit process. But we did, in fact, not stupid, and we have people who pay attention to the communications department uh, cultivate our local constituency for years. And in fact, it got to the point where they're like, we're going to put that thing up. But essentially, um, we had public meetings and we really studied the public. It's driving me crazy. It's echoing. <laughs> Back to the goal. Whoa. Um, where was I? We really studied the public meetings. Oh, yeah, yeah, we looked at the sound. The, the annual testing actually tested a previous machine to this one, a 19-meter rotor machine, the, the original Northern 100. And they had some real sound tests that were published, some papers. And I used those data, and I went around with the sound meter and got back ambient conditions. And we graphed out for ourselves what we felt the anticipated sound levels would be. Um, using using data of a, actually a louder machine, and convinced ourselves that one we were never going to be uh, ten decibels or more above ambient at the lot line because that's the state code that regulates sound generally, and that we weren't likely to get ourselves into 
a sticky situation with our neighbors regarding, regarding, regarding noise. And it was a risk, because you don't really know what these things are going to sound like. And um, by and large, the community was supportive. You have a couple cranky people who don't like anything. And it hasn't been that loud. In fact, when the traffic goes by, and it's pretty windy outside, you wonder if you can still hear it, you know, when the couple trucks go by. On a windy day, it's louder. Um, and, but on the windy days, there's lots more ambient noise, just like the regular story, where it really masks the noise. And since there's a broad spectrum sound that's coming off of the thing, it doesn't seem to travel. Except, except this particular machine, due to the tower design, just like any other tower design, the tower has a natural resonance frequency. It's like plucking the bass string. And what happens is, depending on the height of the tower, the thickness of the metal, and how the generator hums in any system, you're going to maybe transit that natural resonance frequency on, of the tower on your way up to its operational speed, or not. They didn't have this problem with the shorter towers because the thickness of the metal and the resonance frequency was low enough, I guess. So one of the things that they s really scratched their head about is how do we deal with this issue going to a taller tower? So we're still working with that issue. And so at 40, what is it, 51 RPM, if it's just sitting there at 51 RPM on its way up to 56 RPM or 59, depending on the season, it goes whoa, 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 whoa. And I can hear it in my office. You can hear it on the other side of the intersection down there. It really travels because it's a pure tone condition. I bet it shook you up the first time you heard it. Oh, well, I got some calls. <laughs> Joe, is, is this all right? <laughs> um, and so the other thing you're not allowed to do by state code is have any pure tone condition emanating from your property. It's 10 decibels above ambient for white noise and none for pure tone conditions because they drive people nuts. They can drive you nuts. It's like a dog parking. You know, if you're going to be upset by it, you'll be upset by it. Um, so Northern Power is working on that right now. And they're, they're taking it seriously because this is their community wind turbine and they want this market. And I think they'll get it if they can resolve this issue. Is that pure tone issue about the tower or about the uh, blades? It's not about the blades. It's about the generator and the tower and how the generator starts, you know, as it goes faster and faster and faster, because it's an electric motor, it has a hum to it, just like a 60 cycle of hertz hum. Well, it, that hum goes higher and lower as it goes faster and slower, because the RPMs are changing on the generator. And so you get to this point where the generator starts humming at just the right natural frequency or some harmonic there of, <coughs> of the tower, and the tower says, ooh, I can feel some action, oh and it starts magnifying the okay. sound. It's somewhat comparable to rubbing your wet finger on a glass it's of water. It's exactly that. At just the exactly right speed, that. the glass will start yeah. to sing, and the tower will do the same yeah. thing. If it speeds up, it stops. It stops. So it just goes. It just goes through. through it. it transits that point. And so the, our worst, at this point, sound conditions are in low to moderate winds on a lazy day like it's today, probably going to turn out to be, and it, it can just sit there and go. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> on and off all afternoon long, and uh, that's not good. And so, what is Northern Power thinking they can do? They're trying a few different things, and what they have, the first thing is they've clamped the RPMs at 44 right now. This yeah. thing is actually going to produce only about half of as much power as it's capable of doing until we tell them to let the clamp off or um, follow two of the other two or three options that they have. And one of the things that they're looking into is this, essentially this vibrator. It's like a big pancake vibrator thing. You know the noise cancellation technology that you have? Essentially it takes, it creates anti-noise just like the noise you're hearing. But you know, we're getting in those guest That wasn't bad. <laughs> Did they connect um, an electric motor to it to give it to So they get take it that anti-noise that generator and they connect it to the buzzer, the hummer, and they make anti-hum at just 
the resonant <laughs> frequency mm -hmm. of the hummer, yeah. and right. you put and that right in the transmission pack, which is at the base of the nacelle there, yeah. so the hum doesn't get Let's transmitted the to the tower. Time. So that's 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 a, that's that? a huh? Does this have that? They're working on designing that. Okay. <clears throat> There's actually firms out in Utah or Iowa or somewhere that make these things for uh, trucks and ship hulls and big mechanical equipment. And helicopters. I would believe that. I would believe that because you don't want st stuff getting in favor of helicopters. So hopefully they can add that on to this. So that's one of the things they're looking at adding on. And they're also um, working on a way to the generator, because they're electronically controlling the generator, they can change the amount of current that's being drawn from the generator. And I have my electric hub motor on my bicycle. And if you hit the throttle hard, you know, you can hear it go, and actually if you're going too fast down a hill and you you can feel the hum of that motor, but if you add a little throttle to reduce the amount of current going to the motor, it backs off. So electronically they can back off the amount of hum that's generated when it's transiting that 50 mile an hour, 48 to 52 mile an hour period. So they're working on that software control, which sounds simple to describe and complicated to do probably. And I think they got another option. So I think they're, they're pursuing all of them because they want to come out with the full package and not do something lame and not working repeatedly after another. So I figure that'll take them a few months to work out at least. Um, you think they could have an electric motor that got it past that place like like any, like the way you have they can, they can spool up this electric motor. The, what was that? They, they can use the generator as an electric motor. They can in fact click their electronic button and spin this guy up to speed if they want to. Okay. They have the capability of controlling that. It's all done with programs and software. Just to get past that zone. But let's just say you're sitting all day long and it's just that wind speed and you want to both have effective hour output and no sound. You want to, you might want to operate it there, so... Yeah. It's from, I, more than I can figure out. A couple of places doesn't work. Nothing, <laughs> and too much. So, um, Shadow Flicker does not exist for us this time of year. But in the spring and winter and fall, the, the shadow goes right across the front of the building. And when we first got this thing up, you know, going in November, everyone ordered shades for the front of the window. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had we have the, the shades for the sun, and they order darker shades. And so if you put down the darker shade and you turn on the light inside, it becomes not an issue. But the first time I walked down the hall, it was weird. You, you see, see those the second floor, all those... Uh, windows. You know, in the offices, the, the light goes, floods, floods into that hallway right behind those offices. And there's a flicker that's across the front of the building. Like, wah, 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 wah. So it was like a strobe like a down the hall. It was really startling. <laughs> so, um, shadow flicker is real. How long would it last? It depends on the... Where, like the wind direction, whether there are clouds in the sky, it's, there's a lot of different factors that come into play. As it transits the face of the building, I think yeah, it's about 45 day. minutes time Maybe. across the face. And then you have all these additional factors of the weather, how hazy it is, and, you know, um, cloudy, and, and the direction of the, you know, how it's facing. It was all affected. So did you guys do a, um, a study of that, a, an analysis that showed, Greg, like, during... Greg put together a little uh, sketch up for us. And uh, that was that was interesting. But what's really startling is how far that thing reaches. And this time of year, it's great because there's trees around here, and no one sees anything on their houses. But when I go home, and the wind is the wind, the sun is over there setting, and I'm bicycling down Woods Hole Road, the re flicker reaches right across Woods Hole Road to the other side, over there, and it reaches Mrs. Fay's house over there in the spring. And so we actually turn it off at this point in time every morning at between 7.30 and 8.30 for certain months of the year because the, sh the leaves are off the trees and they're falling on her kitchen table, literally. Had you heard from your neighbors? Sorry? Had you heard from your neighbors? We heard from Miss Faye. <laughs> <laughs> Has there been any, any complaints from drivers on the roads? No. The drivers. That doesn't mean they don't complain. It was complaints. Because they might see it just as they drive by. You know, I think... When you're driving by, the flicker of the trees on the road, you know, is, you, know you are constantly seeing stuff. And, and it's, if you're in one place, it's when yeah, you feel... Yeah, if you're stuff, driving you know, toward it, then you're in it. Or, and, or, yeah. I don't know. It's, 
Well, the road is over there, and it only touches the road for 10 minutes a day, maybe, so, in one spot. Right, during certain mm -hmm. times of the year. Yeah, so and, that's right. Yeah. But it's so something it's to think concept. about in placement. Uh, um, you, yeah, you do want to think, especially if you're going to put a lot of them up, big ones, you know, that can reach far. Um, Hard to see with the trees leafed out, but uh, can you tell us where the nearest abutters are and how close, how close, how close this is to the property line? How close this is to the nearest abutters? It's about as far as the fall down radius plus ten feet to the property line that way. Um, the nearest abutters, you know, there's three hundred feet over there. Um, Five hundred feet that way. Six hundred, seven hundred feet that way. Uh, and it, so the, the further away it is, the less time of the day and the year that's going to see anything. Because that's a sun transit path. You know, you've got, it comes and goes sort of slowly relative across the face of the building. But then as you get further and further out the arc, it's moving faster through time. So there's less minutes of exposure. So, but not just for shadow, but for just. Uh, whether it's noise, whether it's just sort of the sense of the presence of the, of the turbine relative to their property. Uh, ha have you heard anything from the 300-foot abutter? It's a renter. A rent it's a renter. It's a renter. You know, it's a renter of a nice brand new suburban house, but it's a renter. Um, when you ask about that for shadow flicker or noise or general aesthetic presence on the on the neighborhood, those really are three distinct questions, I think. Um, in terms of the noise, it drops off six decibels every doubling of distance. That's the rule and that's what really works, unless you've got weird atmospheric conditions, uh, which are pretty rare. Um, in terms of aesthetics, this thing is a profound aesthetic when you're looking up from the road, but you go around the corner and you're like, you can't find the thing for the trees. So it's, it's a highly locationally dependent sort of thing. Um, flicker is easy to describe with, with you know, the little software tools that are out there to do it. And, and a topographic map. And the only complicated thing is coming up with the topography of the things that are affected, like all the buildings. So um, Google SketchUp, for people who know how to drive that thing, um, is a really useful tool. Because they actually give you a, a sun in the sky and they do shadows with it. So uh, you can do a lot with SketchUp. Was this woman the only one who complained about the flicker? Yep. And it's on, her, it's on her kitchen table when she's having coffee in the morning. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty specific condition that doesn't happen a lot. But if you're, if, I mean, you better have the owner right there of the facility. Or you better plant some trees, tall ones. But, I mean, you know, a hedge will knock out something completely. What have you learned about flicker over distance on the water? That's a, you mean, bright flicker as opposed to... Well, very few trees. Uh, so, what happens... You're talking about shadow flicker, or you're talking about light glinting off the blades? Well, they're two completely separate things. Yep. So, you were talking about shadow flicker. Yep. I mean, is it a problem when something's you know, four miles away over a reflecting surface? When I've been out on a sailboat, sailing around here, and it gets to be dusk, and there's one window pane that's yeah. in the eye from Martha's Vineyard, yeah. I, it, I really notice it, you know? It's a big thing. It's pretty amazing that that happens. Um, and that's a surface area, lots of big pane windows, I'm sorry, reflecting at you. Um, this thing is turning and it's not a full surface you know it's parts of a curved surface that are reflecting and so i don't i haven't really experienced any the wind turbines part you can deal with the materials and paint and that sort of thing uh, yeah. that's not i shouldn't be an issue i i just think it would be so rarely to be an issue and so temporarily i mean trivial compared to all the amount of time that's out there i mean I think you get a lot more exposure of damaging stuff from just driving your car and looking into the rear window of the car in front of you during those conditions.
so I I don't think it's much of an issue. I observed bright flicker one evening going back on the ferry to the vineyard from I don't know if it was this turbine or one of the others. It probably would have been this one. I would have thought so. Yeah, because it's the closest one and yeah. the other ones would have been And it was amazing because it was very bright. And how how and it many was a strobe. seconds did you endure that? Um really know. I mean, it a was minute? probably, it was probably more than that. It was quite some time. <coughs> okay. it, was, it was evening and, you know, you're going out on the water. And yep. I thought to myself, well, that's interesting. I'm glad to see that. Right. And it doesn't certainly bother me with one, but it certainly would affect me if it were with a whole field of 30. Sure. <laughs> sure. And that's, that's very You know, what kind of that's installation are we talking about here? That was, yeah, right, exactly. And that would only happen when the sun was very low. And the, wind, yeah. and the yeah. machines are facing certain a certain evening. way, yeah. you know. So whatever material is on this now is not, doesn't take care of that, I guess. Right, but if that was an issue, you could, you could, could the mitigate reflective it. part can be You could make yeah. the blades the black. The shadow flicker is completely different. You know. Right. You know, they painted the blades of this one black over at the uh, automotive tech school on 95 there. It's bad looking. Yeah, I don't think black is a... Well, they did it up on Searsburg, too, and that was for... Yeah, it's for ice issues. Right. Right. We don't really get icing around here. So, and I think they did it there because they had a parking lot. It was right in the middle of a parking lot, and they didn't want ice, ice falling on the cars. For once in several years, ice event would get around here. Do you have problems with ice falling here? Yeah. Unless you get an ice storm, no. And what happens is they, these things just turn off when there's ice on them because they've got accelerometers on the thing so if things are not they, they just shut itself off and then turn it back on. Sensors for the weight of the blade or something if the blades are ice coated to from starting What happens off? is that as the blades get more ice coated they lose lift first of all they just start slowing down and then if there gets to be any imbalances of different weights of ice on different blades then you the accelerometers turn the machine off if they're shaking in ways the system is shaking in ways that it should be shaking. The thing that's not the end of the world that the machine shuts down is you're saying it has a 20 year lifespan that it's only getting worn out while it's being used so they have to shut it off for a couple of hours. That's not you don't you care. Use it for a couple you hours want this more. thing to be protected in every way that it can. Yeah. It's a big investment. It'll last long. Yeah. And, you, and whenever it's moving you get your benefit. It's not you're waiting for benefit. That's right. I like that for a second. <laughs> if you had to start all over, what would, would you do anything different? Uh, not for this machine. I mean, these computer people keep adding these pizza box heaters in the basement. I mean, big time. We're going to supercomputing in the little corner of our room over there, and that's blowing our energy budget. It's really hurting. You know, we're, we're just now sort of carbon neutral, but if these guys keep at it. <laughs> it's, it's not only the computers. The computers half the problem. The other half the problem is the heat the computers generate that you have to then cool. Mm -hmm. And these, these are fussy, expensive machines, and you can't let them overheat, so... What is found as uh, setback? You didn't need to go through permitting. What's it? It's a uh, fall-down radius plus 10 feet. So the whole kit and caboodle to the tip of the blade has plus 10 feet. What do you think of the state? I think the state has a guideline of three lengths. Got it. Three lengths? I think I've heard that. From I the don't model, know. from the state's model? Yes. I can't believe that. No. I, 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 most three of times the, the rotor diameter. Most towns have their own. I would, I would. That's what MTC told, told me. Okay. We were talking about that. It, it, is, it is a town by town regulating sort of thing, and the state can't really override the local zoning system. Yeah. yeah. But most of the towns, at least on the Cape, have been revising their, their bylaws. And that's a very typical one, is the, yeah, that's the tip of the blade about plus the standard, 10 feet. I think. Yeah. Their concern, I think, uh, when I asked them, was they weren't concerned about it at falling and hurting something. They were concerned. They said, you need the three as insurance against a noise problem. Against what? A noise insurance problem. Insurance against a noise problem. Yeah. And, and there's there's merit to that, but there's it's the six decibel with doubling of distance, sound decrease. The, the length plus ten feet would seem to be the minimum. Oh, I, I you, you don't want can. people killed or no. you know, falling on but, someone else's so property. That, yeah. That's the minimum. Maybe. So what happens is with this when we did the um, Palladio Gores, our uh, I'll get to you. Uh, 
building inspector guy who he approves all the building plans. So we went for our building permit. We had to show all the structural stuff and all the engineered stuff. And he was like, is that going to fall on that building or not? And we were like, well, uh, our insurance company doesn't care. He says, I don't care what your insurance company says. So he, he was happy with the fact that the nacelle would just clear the porch. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, blades, a couple up there. You know. But uh, I thought some of the concerns about safety is not so much, like if it collapse, if they collapse, they don't necessarily collapse like that. They sort of crumble more, but it's more, uh, recently it's the blade grow and uh, either ice or or the if there's a collapse condition that the blades themselves will uh, will fly and they're lighter blades and they will fly perhaps longer distances than they had in the I past. think lighter blades in my mind are like pieces of sticks flying around in the storm. When you talk about the, the, the machine that's up at Found Academy, the 10 kilowatt burgy, that's a piece of fiberglass. You know, you got all kinds of stuff flying around in a big storm. When you're talking about failure of one of these, it's it's a catastrophic situation where if those pieces of fiberglass started flying around, I wouldn't want to be around. But I likely wouldn't be around because it's such a big storm, I'd be cowering in my basement, I think. <laughs> really, I mean that's that's the difference between, you know, a burgi or, you know, a proven that flies apart in a in a coastal storm and these guys which are designed for 150 miles an hour. It ain't be nothing standing around here if we see a 150 mile an hour storm. It might be the only thing left standing. Unless you have a catastrophic mechanical problem where you have a runaway machine, which is the ultimate design condition of all of the whole industry is organized around how that happened, just like people are organized not letting planes fly out of the Or not that oil spills happen. Exactly. But, yeah. and, and so it's just and the magnitude you know, of the. Ra they're rare, but response. they do happen. And yep, and if this fails in the biggest way possible, someone might get killed. Someone might get killed. So it's, it's a proportion of benefit look, relative to the. If you look down the hill at the end of your driveway, there's a 36 foot tall pole with a high electricity on the top of it. And if it fell, people several are running people into that might stuff get all killed. The time. They keep hitting that thing. Yeah. Yeah. I swear. How, how's the economic model work out? What you thought you were going to make. So far, things look really good because we had a great winter and we had a really productive winter and we made almost as much power as I thought we'd make in the whole year in six months. So, even running at half speed? No, it hasn't been running at half speed. We, we turned on the half speed clamp a few weeks ago because we, we're getting into the open window time of the year when the winds are modest and going to do a lot of the humming sort of stuff. It really wasn't an issue until you got the low wind speed season. And warmer earlier. Warmer, <laughs> yeah. So, so, is there one last question? Have you had any, uh, have you noticed any problem with bird strikes or anything like that? No dead birds yet, but when, <laughs> when we were, we were worried about our hum. It's getting to be spring and hum and open windows, and we were starting to call Northern Power more frequently about our hum. And like, we decided to turn it off for a couple of days, and there were some maintenance issues that allowed us to do that. And Osprey has started <laughs> thinking this is a good spot. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why the owl is up there because Lisa, who's a naturalist, is like Fred, get an owl up there. Red spot is I hope not. <laughs> no, actually, it's a, it's, it's, it's a point, a little arrow that points which three blades you go. How about lighting? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, have much lighting on it for nighttime? Yeah. So no, it's not, not 200 feet, so it doesn't require FAA light. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Joe, how far down does the slab go? As tall as me. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, it's a big plate. Well, Joe, we have to run. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting. We know what we're doing. Congratulations. We'll come back when it's windy.